All right, I think we're going to get started. Everybody ready? My name is Chuck Yarborough with Pentaho, and I am extremely happy to be here. We're going to be talking about filling the data lake. Um, with me, I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mark Burnett, and I'll be showing a, a demonstration of the product uh, along the way. All right, um, before we get started, how many people are in production with Hadoop? Well, that's a pretty good number. I mean, I would expect more, or, or a good number. Um, how many people are trying to get into production with Hadoop? Some of the same people raised their hands. So, um, great. We're, we're going to talk about the easiest thing in Hadoop. It's getting data in. Nothing easier. Um, but you're going to recognize why it can be a challenge. So <clears throat> let's get started. Um, at Pentaho, we're in the business of helping our customers be successful. And we've been involved in big data technologies for, a num for, for many years. Uh, we do come out of open source. And a lot of our customers were the mavericks of big data. They were very interested in driving some of the things that uh, you're using now. A few years ago, there was a lot of hype about big data. And people were saying, hey, big data is going to save the world. And at the same time, there were others saying, it's all failing. It's not working. We're not getting our investment back. Anybody hear those kinds of things? If you were paying attention a few years ago, you saw that. You heard it. Uh, at Pentaho, we sat back and we thought, well, wait a minute. We've got lots of customers who are doing things today, getting real value out of their big data investments. So what is it that they're doing? And we actually polled our audience, our customers, and we identified three business drivers that had to be there, or let me rephrase that, that were there every time that there was a successful implementation. Those three drivers are what I would recommend you have in place if you're considering big data. If you don't, it's probably a science project. Anybody working on science projects? It's OK to do science projects. But recognize what it is, right? When you move it to the business, it's got to have business value. The first is probably the easiest, and that's drive incremental revenue. What are we doing to grow our business? The second is, are we reducing costs? Are we making things easier, increasing efficiencies? And the third, in the age of the customer, is what are we doing to better engage our customers, make things easier for them, uh, let them buy more easier? Right? If it doesn't have one of these three, I would argue that might be a science project. Okay? As we sat around at Pentaho, and I mean this was people from uh, from the product team, from services, from sales, from all across the company talking about our customers, we looked at a, a laundry list of use cases. And this is years ago. This is probably four plus years ago. What were they doing? Um, and there's actually more, but we mapped them out on what we call the, the spectrum of big data use cases. And you'll see it's... Um, Complexity on the bottom, how easy is it to implement, and its uh, impact. How impactful is this use case? The four that are uh, really ones that we just see repeated time and time again and, and are highly valuable, um, kind of on the low end of the complexity and on the impact, is data warehouse optimization. If you've got a data warehouse, and you're paying too much for it, you know, that's an opportunity to use big data technologies to maybe carve out some of it. Maybe not replace the whole thing, just carve out some. Leverage the technology that's there, deliver more value. We've got great examples of customers that have been wildly successful doing that. Another one is something we refer to as the data refinery. It's really the pragmatic approach to big data analytics. Customer 360. Uh, highly impactful. You'll notice it's way up at the top. It's also kind of out because it's challenging. Anybody doing customer 360 type 
work? Do you have a full customer 360? You're building it, right? That's the right answer. Customer 360 is probably the most transformative thing you can do for your company. Don't try to build the full 360 off the bat. Take it in slices. Is that what you're doing? Slices, right? Adding more. It's a great strategy. All right. What we're here to talk about is the fourth one, which I'm going to call filling the data lake. And I started this out. I said, we're going to talk about the easiest thing in Hadoop. How many ways do you have to load data into Hadoop right now? 15? I mean, I don't know. It might be more than that. There's lots of ways. I could write code. I could do all kinds of things. How many people write code to load data into Hadoop? OK. That's not a problem. I mean, that's, it works, right? It's probably pretty easy. Um, but I, I'm going to give you a, a perspective of some of our customers that, where that becomes a challenge. All right, but let's talk about what Pentaho does. So if you're not familiar with Pentaho, we do come out of open source. Okay? We have a full platform that does everything from data integration all the way through business analytics. Okay? So we help you prepare the data and leverage that data from an analytic perspective, whether that's a visualization, advanced analytics, or whatever. The important thing, and the way I like to look at how data flows is as a analytic data pipeline. Data flows through, and we put that data to work. We'll, do, we'll take actions on that data, constantly improving and preparing that data for the analytic process. There's places that we take that data and we put it into. Data warehouses. How many people have a data warehouse? Okay, most of you. Um, you know, data lakes. That's a place where we put data. But that, that data doesn't just sit there. In the old world of data warehousing, if you're like me, I'm an old data warehouse guy, it used to be perceived that we would grab data from ERP, CRM, wherever, and we would put it into the data warehouse, and then we would access it there. It would never go anywhere else. The reality is data never really stops. It's constantly in motion. So you'll take a copy of that, you'll put it in a data lake, you'll put it in a data warehouse, you'll put it somewhere to do some action. Pentaho automates and manages the entire analytic data pipeline. So all the steps of things you're going to do, and the things that are written up there aren't necessarily the order in which you're going to do them, and sometimes that data wraps back around and, and gets used again. And no longer are we only analyzing data with a visualization. Right? Visualizations are great. It help us, they help us make better decisions. A lot of the most valuable applications I see in my customers are not from uh, visualizations. They're being driven by advanced analytics, machine learning type applications. OK, so that's a little bit about Pentaho. And you know, the data lake, like I said, it's one of those things that you use to put data to work. So let's talk a little bit more about data lakes. How many of you have what you call a data lake? All right, that's great. How many of you have a data swamp? One person admits it. You know, it's funny. I, I talk to a lot of people about these concepts. And I hear people say, well, I don't want a data lake because it's going to turn into a swamp. And, and, and it's... <laughs> It's almost got to the point where people are like, no, no, no I'm not going to go down that path. Uh, a friend of mine, actually one of the founders of Pentaho, coined the term data lake a number of years ago. And the way I like to think of data lakes is not the swamp, but that clean, pure, pristine lake. So when I talk about it, that's what I'm talking about. But what's the difference? You know, when, when, we, when I first started looking into Hadoop years ago, um, it was so easy to say, oh, this is great. I'm going to stand up Hadoop, and I'm going to dump all my data in there. How many of you dump your data in there? Right? That's sort of the way we describe it. And you know, if we actually think about what we are saying, it's probably creating a swamp, because dumping is probably different than managing. 
So the, the point is we really need to think about how we're doing that and what the process is. All right, so Hadoop can be hard, right? Does it have to be hard? I would contend that it doesn't really have to be hard. There are strategies and things we can do to improve it and make it easier. One of those is implement a strategy for integrating data, okay? And when I talk about that, I mean not just pushing data in, but processing and leveraging data across the analytic pipeline. Establish a modern onboarding, data onboarding process. That's really what I'm here to talk about today and what Mark is gonna show you. And then the last is make sure you're governing that data. Your data warehouses are probably well governed. Data lakes tend not to be as well governed, partly by design. Not all the data needs to be as governed but you have to think about what's there, all right? If you don't, that's when you get the swamp. All right, so data lakes come in different sizes. They come in different forms. I have a customer who has seven petabytes in one analytic application. That's a big data lake. Not all of them are that big. Um, but how do we get the data in? What's the proper care and feeding of our data lake? Some of it is, mass amounts of data being ingested. And others are more of maybe a trickle, right? Like a stream coming in, multiple ways, uh, data flowing in. And there's different strategies to put into place based on how that data's flowing. So think about it. What's nice is, and what we announced uh, yesterday was the availability of a, um, what we call a blueprint. It's a uh, well-defined um, design pattern and um, uh, set of guidelines on how to implement this kind of solution. So what are some of these data onboarding challenges? Uh, really simply is, you know, it's not just more data um, that causes more problems. There's all kinds of things, but it does cause issues, and one is uh, around the repetitive nature. And, and those of you that are coding, there's nothing wrong with coding, but you know, if you've got 10 files you gotta get in, that's not, a, that's not a problem. What happens when that number grows? Then it becomes a little more challenging. Um, so how long does that take to build? What's the cost to build that? What's the, what's the challenge to the business? Like if, if we're gonna put a lot of time and effort just into getting data in, uh, you know, what are we missing out on? What are the opportunities we're not attacking? So how do we effectively scale data pipelines? You know, some of the things, I'll just build this out, some of the things that you might be familiar with, I mean, have you ever migrated data from a database to another database? Eh, it's not always very hard. Sometimes it's a pain, right? But that's it's usually easier because there's good tools in place. In, in a, uh, you know, from one system to another can be much more challenging. Um, you know, getting data into Hadoop, uh, again, that's why we're here. We're gonna talk more in detail about that. And then, and then the other one we kind of point out is, what happens when you have a customer who needs to onboard them uh, the, themselves? They need to onboard data themselves. Do we have any uh, SaaS type providers, any companies, software companies represented here? Okay, so getting data from a customer is really important. Right? And we've got customers that do exactly that. They follow this blueprint to get data in quicker, faster, and cheaper. Why? Because that's how you make money, right? And delivers more benefit to them as a customer. So, all right, moving on. So when we talk about data onboarding, we're not just talking about, uh, you know, dumping data. We're, we're really talking about managing those data pipelines, uh, establishing uh, repeatable, processes and, and ways of managing and controlling from a governance perspective. So let's just talk about what, what we're really getting into here. When you have a process, whether you write code or you use a tool like Pentaho Data Integration, you're going to create what I'm gonna call a transformation or an ingest process. And that ingest process will probably point to a file, something as simple as a CSV. That CSV, you know, has columns, rows, whatever, and you'll map 
your ingest procedure to do, you know, to map to the data source and then, you know, where you want it to go. And in Hadoop, a lot of the people I see, kind of a best practice, is if it's a CSV file, they want to take that CSV file and simply copy it in. That's super easy. But once it's in Hadoop, that's not really the best format. So a lot of my customers are saying, hey, you know what? I, I also want to, in the ingest process, I actually want to format that data in Avro. Anybody using Avro? It's one of many formats available. Other people say Parquet. It depends on your use case. What we see repeated is Avro. But the point is, streamlining that process is a little more complex. It's not just a copy. Now you're doing more. Um, when it's one, it's no big deal. I can write code. I can use PDI to, or Pentaho Data Integration to create something. What happens when it scales? When you have lots of, of these files, and they're all different. They're not the same. You know, I mean, if they're all the same, again, it's pretty easy. But it might be different formats. Might, some might have metadata. Some might not have metadata. How do you manage in that environment? That's the pain that I'm seeing our customers have. So there are customers that are struggling with not a hundred unique files. They're in the thousands. One bank in Europe is dealing with literally 6,000 different formatted files. That's a lot. Just think about how long it would take to create all those transformation processes, let alone what's going to happen when something fails. You know, the maintenance of that alone is, is ridiculous. That's the pain. That's the problem. Anybody seeing this in your environment? Okay. A few. Good. So, um, so what we're talking about in this thing called a blueprint is how Pentaho really enables you to fix this, right? We're talking about a streamlined approach for ingesting volumes, not just volumes of data, but volumes of file, uh, high scale problems, um, reduced dependence on hard coding, or on even um, configuring transformation processes at scale. You know, if I've got to go build a, th I might have a tool that's really easy, but a thousand of those is painful. And then, uh, you know, also just get a handle on the regular routine loading and maintenance of data into the lake so that you don't get that unknown uh, or dirty swamp, right? That's, that's what we want to do. We want to apply a, a level of governance to do that. The way you end up doing that is by having a highly dynamic transformation process that has intelligence built in and can literally identify uh, the metadata at execution time. So there is this concept that we have at Pentaho, we refer to it as metadata injection. It, think of it as making your transformation process highly dynamic. All right, Mark is gonna show you exactly how that works and kind of the magic behind it. So with that, I'm gonna actually turn it over to Mark and he'll guide you through this template-based approach and then I will return. Okay, thank you, Chuck. So with Pentaho, we allow you to separate your data workflow from your metadata and create a template for your overall workflow. So the idea here is that normally you would need to create lots and lots of different ETL workflows, lots and lots of different scripts for each of the different types of data sources you have. But again, if you have thousands of those, you don't want to manage thousands of scripts or thousands of uh, ETL workflows or what have you. If you are able to abstract away the metadata out of those workflows and scripts, it become much more reusable. And Pentaho allows you to do that using what we call a template. So one template can be used to serve many different types of data sources. So in terms of building the templates, you still may need more than one template. Uh, so what we see our customers doing is maybe have a few, a handful of different templates for the different types of overall workflows. So for example, if I want to take relational data and put it into Avro, I might have one template that does that. Uh, now that could be reusable across many different databases, different tables, and so forth, 
um, but, and go to different paths and different places in Hadoop, uh, but, it, but they could have a one template to share that. A second example may be taking flat files and processing them and converting them into Avro format. Or perhaps just taking flat files and loading them raw as is into HDFS. So the idea is we just have a handful of templates for these very generic high-level workflows, and they can be reused over and over again. So the important thing to note is if you have a template like moving data from a flat file to Avro, um, it can serve uh, not only files of different structures, like tab delimited, comma delimited, or other types of structures, but they can also be different types of data. So you could have customer data, order data, different sets of fields, the fields can be different orders. You have quite a bit of variation in the type of data that can all share that same template. And I'll show an example in the product of how exactly this works. But the key takeaway here is that instead of managing lots and lots of ETL workflows, lots and lots of scripts, you're really talking about managing metadata itself. So let's talk about that. How do we manage metadata? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to acquire the metadata. That means you have to figure out what are the columns, what are the data types, and so forth that are in that data set. If we're talking about the example around relational databases, well, we're going to need to get a lot of information to put in Avro. So Avro is a format that will store not only the data, but also information about the structure of the data, so the field names, and the data types, and so forth. Right? So we can automate the extraction of a lot of that metadata from the database itself. The database itself can provide you with the table names, or the field names, and the data types, and so forth. So what that means is that all you really need to provide to the template is the database connection, the tables, and perhaps even the fields. Or, or perhaps have a checkbox say, I just want all of it. Give me this, everything in this database, right? So the level of granularity is up to you, but you don't need to provide the low-level details around the metadata. We can extract that for you. If we're talking about a flat file, well, one example is we're just going to load the raw data as is. In that case, there's no parsing involved. All you need is the paths to where you're pulling from, where you want it to go. Very simple. If you're looking at converting into Avro, again, we, we need the metadata for that. We need to know the delimiter, how to parse that file, data types, and so forth to create that Avro format. So here again, Pentaho has capabilities to automatically extract that from the file itself. We can scan the file, extract the metadata, and build that. So whether you're talking about just loading as is, or converting it to Avro, or even some other type of format, all you need to provide the template is the path, and it can take care of the rest. Right? So let's take a look at this in action. So I'm going to start by taking a look at a, a very, very simple example of an ETL workflow. Uh, for moving a, a flat file from point A to point B. It could, it could be coming from Hadoop, could be landing in Hadoop uh, uh, in various formats. It could be other types of data sources and targets and so forth. But for this case, I'm just going to take a very simple example. Now, when you typically build out uh, a workflow like this, it is going to have the metadata hard-coded. It's going to include things like the it's going to include things like the field name or, or the path to the file. It's going to include things like the delimiter, the enclosure, the encoding, uh, the field names, the data types, the uh, date uh, and, and number masks, and so forth, right? And that's not only for the source, but the same for the target. You may need to reorder the fields or take a subset of fields or, uh, or what have you. And of course, you need the path to the, to the file target itself. Um, so in this case, we have a hard-coded example. And this is what we're seeing a lot of repetition with our customers. Different types, different formats, different data in your files, uh, different routines. And they've got to manage hundreds of thousands of these. So the idea is we're going to tease this out and create a template. So the template looks like this. It pretty much looks identical. And it is identical, except that we've gone in and we've stripped out all the settings. We've stripped out the path, the delimiter, the enclosure, the field names, data types, and so forth for both the source and the target. And by the way, uh, these workflows could be much more complicated. You have other types of steps and processes in between that also need metadata. What are you going to aggregate? What are you going to sort on? What have you, right? So all of those can be templated. 
Now, at runtime, what we want to do is we want to extract the metadata that we found in a scan, inject that into this template so that it becomes just like that hard-coded version, and then go run it. And here's a workflow uh, that does exactly that. So in this case, uh, we've got a couple of things going on here. This, this first step is going to say, OK, let's allow you to supply at runtime as a parameter the input path and the output path. So remember, again, for files, because we can do all the metadata automatically, that's all the end user, the customer, the provisioning, what have you. That's all it needs to be provided. So in this case, this is going to capture that parameter and feed it into this, this uh, subsequent step. In this case, this step is going to do the scanning of the file, extract all of the metadata out of that, and it's going to feed it into the template. This step right here actually does the wiring up of the metadata to the template itself, and then goes and runs the template. If we take a look at that, the settings inside that step, basically the first thing is we just point to our template itself. And then within the template, it will bring up each of the individual steps that are in that template, like the source or the target or any other intermediary processing steps. And for those, we can wire up all those individual settings that we looked at, the delimiter, the enclosure, the field list, and so forth. right? And those can be wired into the template. So when we run this workflow, it's going to inject the metadata into the template, and then it's going to go and deploy the template. And, that could, and there's actually even more options around that. We could decide we just want to render the template and run it later. Uh, we may want to save a copy of the template that's hard-coded and run it. Uh, or we may just want to run it and not leave any artifacts at all. We can also carve off and save the metadata itself in parallel as, as well as rendering the template. So hopefully this gives you a, an example. So now let's go ahead and run this. So I'm going to run this against two different files. So the first file is uh, going to be some sales data, and it's comma delimited, and, and it has a, you know, this structure and lots of fields. And I'm going to go ahead and run that. And when I run that, I'm going to supply uh, the uh, path to the input. And I'm going to supply a path to the output. And in this case, I'll call this uh, just output. Out one. I'll just call it that, and we'll launch that. And it's going to go and run. Now, when it runs, I can actually preview and look at the data. So here, if I click on this step, I can see the input path, the output path. I can see the metadata that was captured. So this is uh, the, the, encode, the character set, the fields that it found, and so forth. And then I have the output itself. So next, I want to look at a, a second file. So the second file looks very different. It's a different, different structure, different fields, and so forth. So in this case, if I go and run this one, I just supply the different path. I'll call this sales data 2. And uh, I'll call this out 2. So, so I'll call this uh, data two. Call it something else. So this runs and so forth. So again, same template, any different type of file format, right? And I can just supply as a parameter where I want to pull from and where I want to land it. So. As we can see, this approach, this process, really lets us go from uh, a provisioning that would potentially require ETL development that might take days to look at a new type of file uh, or a new database source or what have you, to really being able to just provision an existing template in a matter of minutes. And this can all be instrumented with a web front end and as part of a SaaS, that sort of thing. right? So Chuck, why don't you uh, help us wrap up? I think we have a few minutes uh, for questions, too. Second time I've knocked over the light. <laughs> so, um, did, I mean, does this, does it make sense? You see what we're doing? Making it dynamic really gives you the ability to manage these things at scale. Uh, scale that 
uh, you know, really hasn't been done before. So a couple things to think about. Um, you know, Mark kind of mentioned it. Manage, manage metadata versus a bunch of ETL procedures or ELT uh, procedures, right? And that's the other thing. So, you know, everybody knows what ETL, extract, transform, load, and oh yeah, ELT, extract, load, then do the tra Best practice we've seen around Hadoop, extract, load, transform once it's there, right? Use the scale that you can. Um, you know, really do it with a minimum configuration and uh, ultimately reduce your cost, your risk, and, uh, and, and simplify. Again, it goes back, this is the easiest thing you guys can do is load data in, right, ingest. But it becomes so problematic. And I've seen major projects fail because of a lack of management on the ingest alone. So build yourself uh, a way to onboard all kinds of data in a simple fashion, in a maintainable fashion, and in a more governed fashion. That's really the takeaway here. So a couple of things that you know, I'd recommend you do. One, take a look at Pentaho. Uh, our website, we have a whole section on filling the data lake. There's, some, uh, there's some, some content there, some videos that you can leverage. You can see some things like what Mark presented today. Um, and um, download, you know, if you haven't used Pentaho, we do have the, the platform available for being downloaded and, and you know, a 30-day license to work with it. Give it a shot. Um, and if you have any questions, if you're going to do that, if you're going to evaluate, please reach out to us. We're really here. We want you to be successful. It's really important. So um, with that, uh, do we have any questions? I think we have a minute or two. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, we, we access the technical metadata. What about the business metadata? Go ahead. So that's a great point. So you know, we've really shown a very, very simple example. What we see in practice is kind of building that into more complex solutions. So for example, we have customers uh, where they have a model where they're importing data from lots of their customers. And they're calling their terms different things. You know, they may call it L name, and the other one is last name, or last underscore name, right? So we allow you to not only extract the technical metadata at runtime, but let's say you wanted to rename those fields to harmonize or normalize that data around your target schema. That could just be another step, a rename step that's in your template. And instead of extracting that, uh, the translation from the file itself, you just have that, that, the term that the customer gave it. We can go and do a lookup and look up what that field should be called, and even potentially apply some fuzzy logic to make some guesses as to what we think it looks like, in terms of it looks like a last name or it looks like a first name, and then pick the right business term for that and land it in perhaps a multi-tenant schema or that sort of thing, right? So we have much more sophisticated use cases, and whether that's done on the ingest or really more as a ELT process after the fact. Uh, we support injecting that metadata from many different sources uh, using many different types of contexts, including business metadata. Okay, great question. Uh, I think there was one back here. Uh, do you have any uh, capabilities around data capture and how you handle that? And maybe, you know, what I saw was great for initial data load, but when, when you have changes coming in the data... So, so I'm going to jump in. I'm going to say absolutely we do. But that's a bigger conversation. So in interest of time, uh, come on up. Let's have a conversation. Uh, that work? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, over here? Oh, that was the same question. Yeah, that's a hot topic. Yeah. Yes? So uh, like data capture from data source, how do you handle things like duplicating of data or you need to have like, transformation for that? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll do a quick answer. Um, you know, It'll be use case specific. So a lot of times what I'm seeing is customers still want to get that raw data set in. So whether it's, you know, so it hasn't been deduped at that point. 
and then you go through that process. Now, uh, the transformation process to do the deduping and, and apply some level of cleansing, processing, and conforming, and other steps. So again, it goes back to you know, thinking about how the data flow happens within Pentaho data integration. Each step may have something else. I don't know if there's any additional comments. Yeah, so the whole concept of being able to manage metadata and, and not have to hard code that into your workflows is relevant all throughout the data pipeline, both the ingest, the processing, advanced analytics, and even on the front end in visualization to allow customers to pick and choose what they want to visualize and maybe orchestrate a workflow around that. So we do support those capabilities uh, through that entire pipeline. This is really just kind of showing an example how you know square one of your process is getting the data in, and if you're going to do that in a metadata way, uh, driven way, that supports you being able to continue that through the rest of the data pipeline, if that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, please let us know if you do have any other questions. Please stop by the Pentaho booth. There's a party going to be tonight. We'd love to see you and talk to you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>